Ah, we'll be a mile of weight on Chris's shoulders, then. <laughs> oh, dear. Right, okay, well, turn in your Bibles, if you're looking at a Bible, or turn to your head to the screen, if you're looking at the screen, to Luke 19. We're looking at a very well-known Bible passage. You should know this. It's about a man called Zacchaeus. We probably, well, I didn't go to Sunday school, but you probably sang songs about him in Sunday school. I didn't go anywhere till I was 23. But because the Lord found me, the Lord got a hold of me, and he told me to go to church. And I've been going every Sunday since, except when I've been poorly, or there's been some other good reason. But uh, the Lord found me. He found me when I was looking in all the wrong places. I was looking for something. I'm not sure I was looking for Jesus. Somebody once, as I've told you many times, somebody once offered me a new testament. I said, oh, no, no, thank you, that's not for me. I need something mystical, something different, something novel. But Jesus finally found me when I was 23. And we're going to look at the story of a, a man here who was... Looking for Jesus, but what I didn't realise was Jesus was looking for him. Isn't that true of us? Mm -hmm. Spend our lives looking for something. But the Lord is seeking us. The Lord is a good shepherd, isn't he? Yeah. And even when we've wandered into a, a foggy, dark forest late at night, the shepherd will come to find us. Doesn't he come and find us? Whatever mess we're in, however far we've gone from where we're supposed to be. And this man... Um, was far from the Lord, but the Lord was looking for him. Let's read from Luke 19. Jesus entered Jericho. Do you remember last time we were looking at Jesus moving toward Jericho? And there was a blind man on the road. Do you remember? He said, was, what's going on? He said, Jesus is passing by. And he called out and didn't give up. And finally made contact with Jesus, and Jesus healed him of his blindness. Well, here we have another man in Jericho itself. Jesus has entered Jericho, was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short... He could not see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come. To this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Well, I've got, thought of a title for this talk. I don't usually have titles, but I couldn't resist. And I've called this talk The Man Who Went Through the Eye of a Needle. That's a shocking image, isn't it? The man, I tried to generate an AI image of that, but he was doing all this weird stuff. Oh, okay, just tell him. <laughs> the man who went through the eye of a needle. Why is that? Why, why am I calling it that? Well, if you just look a few verses back in your Bible, you will see this verse. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich. To enter the kingdom of God. You don't think of Zacchaeus in that way, do you? But look what it says about him. He was a chief, not just a tax collector, he was the one who employed 
the tax collectors. They were big money making people. It says he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He's a rich guy. He's a rich man in Jericho. Now this Jericho, apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's not the Jericho of the Old Testament where the walls fell flat. That was a ruin. But it was kind of built in a separate location nearby. And it was a very lovely place. And apparently the main street was lined with these <coughs> sycamore fig trees that apparently were quite easy to climb because they had big branches low down so you could get up that quite easily. You know, when I was a kid, we used to climb trees, you know, around where I used to live. And Sometimes you'd have to bang a nail in the trunk, you know, bang some big six inches and climb up the nails to get to where the branches were. But apparently, you could climb it quite easily. They were quite easy to climb. And the street was lined with them. And the climate there was quite good. Farming was good. It was quite a lush and a luxurious place and town. And this man is there as a chief tax collector. Um, the reason for that is there it was a trade route going north, east and west. A lot of roads passed through Jericho going out to Caesarea and going up north to Galilee and going east as well to other nations. Quite a trade route. So there'd be heavy tax um, issues there. People would be charged for the transmission of goods to and fro and so on. And he was a man um, that was in charge of the whole endeavour, a rich man, a rich man, even though Jesus said, oh, it's so hard for a rich man. Do you remember the rich uh, man who came to Jesus, the young man, and he said he kept the commandments, and Jesus said, well, there's something you're lacking, give away your riches. Why did he say that? Because he was obsessed with his riches, his riches were his life. It was a barrier between him and God. Um, and so he told him to give it away. But he wouldn't. And he got sad. And he went away sad. Realising he couldn't be a follower of Jesus. And love his money. And treat his money like a God. This is, man is a different kettle of fish. And um, I want to focus on him a little bit. Firstly. Because Jesus. As we read earlier in the book, Gospel of Luke. He's travelling toward Jerusalem. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew his destiny was there. He knew it was written about him that the Messiah must suffer. He must be spat upon. He will be crucified. He will be buried. And he will be raised on the third day. And he's heading there for these things that are going to happen to him. But he stops in Jericho on the way. And although the Lord must have been consumed with what was coming, imagine someone tells you, well, that's going to happen to you. You'd just be preoccupied, wouldn't you, with it? But Jesus always has time for strangers, always has time for people who want to see him, people who want to bring their children to him, people who want to get a touch from him, people who are sick and want to be healed by him. Jesus always has time. And I believe Father God must have said to Jesus here, there's somebody in that town I want you to speak with. Because Jesus says, I must come to your house. There's an imperative. I must come to your house today. That's what Christ said to this man, Zacchaeus. He knew very little about that. He perhaps, although he was an important man, very important man financially, he must have thought, Jesus won't want to know me, he'll just think I'm a, a total loser because of the way I've spent my life and the way I've abused people out of their money. But, um, but he wants to see him anyway. So he sees the crowd, he knows it's Jesus passing by, so he runs and he finds he's so small, he's a little guy, he can't see over the heads of the crowd. So he looks around, I'll go up that tree, he finds a tree, he gets up the tree and he looks there from the tree just to see Jesus. It tells us there, look, he wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd, etc. I already mentioned it to you. So there's this man Zacchaeus. Jesus 
has got the sense, I've got to meet that man today, I've got to spend time with him. And it tells us, doesn't it, that he was passing through, but he's got time to stop. Sometimes the Lord, we might think, well, you know, there isn't time, but the Lord always has time for us, doesn't it? Have you spoken with him at all today? Have you spent any time with him? He's interested in you. He's interested in your problems. He's interested in your aches and pains. He's interested in your disappointments. And as Chris has shared with us this morning, the Lord, and Mark shared as well, didn't he? But the Lord is a magnificent person. He's an amazing, amazing person. And who better to tell your troubles to than the Lord Jesus Christ is listening He's prepared, he's not just passing through, he's prepared to stop. He wants to come to your house, he wants to dwell in your house, doesn't he? He wants to dwell in your life. We become, don't we, a, a house for Almighty God. Have you become a house for God? Has God moved in? <coughs> You're not alone. You're not alone in there. You might think, I'm alone in my troubles. My life's not working out the way that I hoped it would. But the Lord knows, and the Lord is willing to... Move into your life and be in your life and cause it to be fruitful. Doesn't didn't Jesus say, I've called you that you may bear fruit? Amen. That your fruit may abound. You might feel, oh, my life's a bit useless. <clears throat> what good can I do? I've wasted half of my life. I've wasted my time. Well, the Lord wants to move in. He wants to not just pass through, but to stay. To stay. He'll come and remain in you. Don't be one of those, these people who feels that the Lord comes and goes, he moves out, he's gone. I don't know where he's gone, but he's gone. Well, that's not the Lord, it might be you gone. It might be you left home. I know I left home, I fell out with my parents when I was 11. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving home! And off I went, and my mate had a tent in his garden. And I sat in the tent all afternoon. And a big posse of local kids came. We found him! We found him! <laughs> My mum was in tears and she took it very seriously. He's left home! He's left home! I'm only 11. But I uh, did leave home a lot later when I was 17. I regret that now. I regret that I left under such bad circumstances because it can create a wound and a scar, can't it, within us? Where well, the Lord is not in the business of coming, going, leaving, and being unpredictable. The Lord is a rock, isn't he? The Lord is solid. I always found when I became a believer, at last I found a true father. I found somebody who really accepts me, somebody who cares for me. Somebody who's not going to come and go <coughs> and be moody and be unpredictable and clip me around the back of the head and stuff like that. No, the Lord is not like that. He's a tender, loving master who wants you on his side. He wants you in his house, doesn't he? He wants to be with you permanently. Some of you may be struggle to grasp the idea of permanence, but you know, Jesus says we'll be with him forever, if we're a believer this morning we'll be with the Lord Amen. forever, let's settle that in our minds I'm going to be with the Lord forever <coughs> don't doubt that, he's a covenant keeping God he keeps his promises and he's able to finish what he began, isn't it? Isn't Jesus able to complete the work he began that he might feel, oh, I'm not making very good progress. Who am I? I'm just a mess. Well, the Lord is good at taking hold of our mess, making it into something really good. That's what he wants to do, doesn't he? Amen? Amen, Amen. Amen of course. And Zacchaeus here, he's gone to try and see this Jesus. He's an important man. He's a wealthy man, very wealthy man. But he's an unpopular man. Did you notice when the people saw what happened? They said, oh, he's gone to be with that sinner. He's gone to be with the sinner. They complained about Jesus and they insulted uh, Zacchaeus as well. I want to look at this man and look at um, his attitude to Jesus. He's very enthusiastic. Not like some of us are in Paul along, don't we? How are you this morning? Oh, I'm not too bad. You know. But the Lord is here with us. You know, let's celebrate. When we come together, let's celebrate and, and be glad and rejoice because we get to see Jesus. This man, I think of him as having a, a childlike enthusiasm because as a wealthy man and an important man, you wouldn't be seen running down the street. He just wouldn't do that. And you definitely wouldn't climb a tree. 
But this man, although he's quite important and wealthy, he behaves like a child, running, climbing, enthusiastic. I've got to see this person, I've got to meet him, I've got to see who he is. I wonder, have you lost your enthusiasm? You know, the Bible talks, doesn't it, about once when we were first converted, we had a, a vibrant, passionate love for Jesus in the book of Revelation. You've lost your first love. It goes deeper, doesn't it? Maybe some of the froth and the bubble fades, and some of the initial enthusiasm changes, and, you know, but it should deepen. It should deepen. Now, this man... He's very, very enthusiastic. He's like a child. Everybody else has written him off. I mean, I guess I was a bit like that. I was, as a, in my early 20s, I was known around the estate where I lived. And some of my friends, they saw me. I'd grown a bit of a beard. I wasn't working. I'd been unemployed. I'd been smoking the wrong stuff. Cigarettes, that's the wrong stuff. And other things as well. And I was just in a, not in a good place and people were all there he goes again looking at me they're out of loser no job he's hanging around with the wrong people he's in a bit of a mess but the lord must have seen me as the lord looked around that council estate of seven thousand people who would have thought a number that were already christians but the lord must have thought i'll have him i'll find him and he found me in a in a dark wood in fog one night i was out on my head and the Lord showed up. It was real. He didn't well, how does that happen? How did you see him? Yes, not, not with my literal eyes, but I saw him with my heart and I heard him with my inner ears. The Lord came looking for me and I knew, I knew it was Jesus. Hallelujah. And he's, he found me. Somebody's come looking for me. I don't want to be in this mess. But I was. Sometimes we don't want to be in the mess that we're in. But the Lord comes looking for us, doesn't he? Does he do that? Yes. Of course he does. And he comes and makes all the difference. And this man is so enthusiastic. And then it tells us in verse 6, Jesus looks up. Just like he's looking at you right now. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house. There it is. I must I'm passing through, yes. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, yes. But I've got time for you. I want to be with you. I want to come and spend time with you. Because I can see you're seeking. I can see your enthusiasm. I can see you want to engage with me. You want to know who I am, says Jesus. And so I must come to your house. And there he is. Jesus going into the house. Of this enthusiastic man. And it tells us there. He came down at once. And welcomed him gladly. The word there is the word for joy. Luke uses that word quite a lot. Rejoicing in heaven over a sinner. Well he's rejoicing. He's glad. He says gladly. That's a little bit weak. He's joyful. He's come to my house. Get the food ready. Come on everyone. Let's get organized. Jesus is here. You welcome Jesus warmly. You know, the Lord knows your heart, whether your heart is warm toward Him. How is your heart this morning? Are you enthusiastic about Him? Are you warm toward Him? Do you want to welcome Jesus more fully? Maybe some of you, for the first time, welcome Jesus in to your life. Well, this man. He did just that. He welcomed him warmly. Even though the crowd criticised, the crowd ridiculed, the crowd mocked and insulted, saying, what's he doing going to that man's house? He's just a big sinner. We all know that. But that's where Jesus went. And then the other thing about Zacchaeus. The Lord knew this. The Lord knew he was coming to see a man who was keen to see him, enthusiastic, joyful to receive him. But he knew he was willing to change. Willing to change. It does tell us there, doesn't it? After the people had muttered, what did Zacchaeus have to say? 
He said, Lord, I'm willing to give up half of the riches that I've got and give it to the poor. And if I've robbed anybody, I'll give it back. Four times the amount. There were Jewish rules about making <coughs> restitution, but not, not that much. He's willing to go a lot further. He's willing to give away half of what he's got. He's willing to change. There's a, a radical repentance. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we might feel somehow we're doing Jesus a favour by being one of his followers. Oh, well, you know, add numbers to the church. And, oh, well, you know, somebody needs to fly the flag for Jesus in this godless age. Well, you know, to be honest... We're not doing him any favours. He doesn't need us. He chooses us. And he uses us as well, doesn't he? And we get the blessing and the privilege of serving him through his church and serving him with our lives. And this man, he just thought, let him all go. It's all meaningless compared with him. I don't need all this wealth the way I thought I did. I need Jesus. And I wonder what's in the way. What's in the way? Are you willing to change? Maybe you've come to a, a mindset that says, well, things are the way they are. I can't change now. My life is the way it is. But, you know, Jesus comes to you right where you are, and it may be he wants you to make some radical decisions in order to enjoy life in the Spirit. <laughs> In order to get the joy of the Lord, it maybe something has to go. Maybe something has to go. I heard somebody say that there's no peace with God unless there is war on our sins. No peace with God unless there's war against our sins. And sometimes we've allowed our sins and our compromises and our preferences and our bad attitudes and our unbelief to crowd in on us so that God, we can hardly hear his voice anymore. And God says, those things have to go. I know when I first became a believer, I had literally nothing. Nothing. A scruffy little flat. My wife will tell you that. Was that it was. I tidied it up a bit when I became a Christian. When Ruth came, it was not too much. There was not much there. No, no savings, no property, nothing. Just a little rented... Flat. But there were some things that I'd been doing. I'd been making these new agey, occultic designs on pictures on my wall. Those are my treasures. Just rubbish, really. But, but the Lord told me, they've got to go because of what they mean. They're the wrong thing. You've been concentrating on the wrong thing. So I burned them all in the garden round the back of the flats. There's a pastor came and said, what, what are all? So I'll take them all off of the woods. What, what are all these? You know, said, oh, they're all designs and weird devilish things and occultic religious. He said, let's have a bonfire. So I thought, yes, let's have a bonfire. So we burned it all. It was worthless. It meant something to me. That was my treasure at the time. But I have to keep challenging myself. Have I taken on board other treasures? Have I, have I attached other things to my life that may be... Like Zacchaeus, oh Lord, let me give them away. I want to give them away. Sometimes we have to do that, don't we? If something's become a treasure more than God, it's got to go. I don't know if I'm speaking to anybody this morning. I speak to myself, I really do. Um, but this man, he was willing to change whatever it takes. I want Jesus in my home. I want Jesus in my life. I want the salvation he is offering. So... I will get rid of this other stuff that's been my God. And uh, the result of all this, Jesus getting a word from his father, find that man, speak to him, go to his home, right, where is it? Oh, there he is, right, I must come to your house today. And then this joyful welcome of Jesus, <laughs> and this radical repentance, give it all away. <coughs> and then the result of all that was Salvation, wasn't it? Salvation. It tells us there. Today, says Jesus, today salvation has come to this house. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek 
and to save the lost. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is saying that everlasting life from God has come to this little man. He has now been saved. That's what Jesus is meaning. He doesn't mean, oh, he's, uh, he's not going to be thought badly of anymore. He said, he's coming to a relationship with me. Salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. That doesn't mean he's a Jew. He was a Jew. Doesn't mean he was just a Jew. Oh, he's, salvation has come because he's a Jew. No. Why is he a son of Abraham? He's a son of Abraham because he's got the same faith of Abraham. You can see that unpacked in the rest of the New Testament, and particularly in the letter of Romans. To be a child of Abraham is to have the faith Abraham had, and the faith Abraham had was, at the moment there's nothing, but God's going to make something. At the moment there's no land, but God's going to give us land. At the moment there's no kids, but God's going to give us a, a nation. And God's going to give us his promises forever and ever. He will be my everlasting God. The faith of Abraham. Amen. And I wonder, have you got the faith that where there's nothing, there'll be something Maybe where the fountain is blocked up, a bit like in Jeremiah, I think it's chapter 2, isn't it? The, uh, the fountain gets blocked with rubbish that's come from the Philistines, and it needs unblocking, needs unblocking. And uh, for, the, for the water to flow, sorry, I'm, I'm fusing two verses together, I'm fusing uh, Genesis 26 with Jeremiah 2. They're both about the, the blocking of a well. And Isaac had to unblock the well, didn't he? And then in Jeremiah we get the same thing. People are drinking from a polluted well <coughs> and forsaking the fountain of living water. Which one do you want this morning? We want the real water of life from Jesus, don't we? And he's given that because he's got the faith to receive it. And the final verse there, and we must keep a hold of this in this day of small things. Aren't we in a day of small things at the moment? Just a little handful of us. In church, in a town of roughly 12,000 people, I think it is at the moment, 12,000 and growing, houses are being built everywhere, aren't they? But in the midst of that, there's maybe 200, 250 believers, I don't know, I don't know what the number is, there's a lot of backslidden, ones who once, once were in church and no longer are, some that go out of the area to church, but in the main, it's only a few hundred, but we're in a town of unbelievers, aren't we? And we need to remember this. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So as we're passing through, we need a word from the Lord, don't we? Spend time with that woman. Spend time with that man. Speak to that person. I think of Paul in Corinth, where he's told, don't leave. I've got many people in this city, and God has got many people around town, hasn't he? Do you think, do you think he has? Mm -hmm. Or are we it? Is this it? No, the Lord wants to reach many, many people. He came to seek and to save the lost. And I think just as he came to Jericho with a word from his father, there's a man here I want <coughs> to speak with. There's plenty of people here God wants us to speak with so that they can receive Jesus enthusiastically. Some people are not interested, are they? Well, what can you do then? But some people are. And there'll be some who are enthusiastic. And they will welcome Jesus. You know, Jesus said, unless you turn and become like a child. Like really touched me and moved me this morning when little Judith wanted me to. I've never done that before. She reached over. And I really felt my heart warmed and moved. Because that's like God, isn't it? But we've got to reach toward him. And he will receive us. He will warmly welcome us. And this man, Zacchaeus, he was welcomed by Jesus, wasn't he? And uh, have you got that kind of heart this morning? Have you got a warm heart? An enthusiastic heart? Have you got a willingness to do what Jesus did and share? Even though people may criticise the town, say, ah, oh, he's going to that sinner, what's he doing that for? Even though people may criticise, are we willing to stand by Jesus and receive Jesus Amen. and do what Jesus did? It says, here I am, I stand at the door. <coughs> Knock. He didn't stand at Zacchaeus' door, did he? It was wide open. Come in, come in. Come and eat with us. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him 
and he will be. That's the key to our church's future, our church's success. Is that we've got a wide open door for Jesus. And we've got a heart that's warm for Jesus. And we've got a welcoming spirit that welcomes Jesus right into the middle of all that we do. Think of Anna's ideas and we want to be a church that's friendly, welcoming, socialising and being friendly with one another and warmly welcoming others in as well. Well, this is the key. Are we willing to open the door as Jesus knocks? So, amen, we'll finish there. I'm going to just pray before we hand back to the <coughs> worship team. I mean, we can get on the summer bandwagon, can't we? All right, summer now, holidays and busyness. But let, let's not forget Jesus. Let's mm. continue. Let's not have a holiday from Jesus. Let's continue to walk with him and be with him and welcome him and be warm toward him so that he can use us. Let's just pray. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it is such a joy to share this story from your word, this little man, this wealthy man, this important man, but this unpopular man. Yet he was the one that you wanted to see that day. And Lord, I just thank you that we are the one you want to see. We are the one you want to hang out with and, and come to our home and come into our lives. And Lord, may we, like Zacchaeus, have an enthusiasm. May we have our eyes opened. May we be willing to welcome Jesus. And may we be willing to do what has to be done to get rid of the rubbish that's standing in the way. That Jesus may be king in our hearts. Jesus may be sovereign in our lives. And uh, Lord of this church too, Father God. Oh Lord, we just cry out to you. Work amongst us. Forgive us all that's past. Forgive us all that's hindered us. Forgive us the wasted years. Forgive us the wasted energy in life. And Lord, give us another chance as a church, we pray. We don't mm -hmm. presume on your goodness, Lord. You know, in many ways we've been backslidden and dry and dusty in some ways. But Lord, thank you that you are still with us, we pray. May the gates and the doors of this church be thrown wide open. That Jesus may be welcomed, that Jesus may work in this place amongst us. We give you glory and praise. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Amen.